Oh, good. <laughs> I must say, I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> Hi, it's Todd of Todd's Workshop and Todd Cutler here and today we're back with the lockdown longbow, some arrows and some questions. So first of all, for those new to this, the lockdown longbow is quite clearly not a longbow, but it shoots these medieval style, medieval weight arrows at the same speed as a 160 pound longbow, English longbow. So that's why I can use this to do my trials. It's just a proxy, it does the same thing and the target doesn't care. So starting right at the top, it's not the English longbow, it's the Welsh longbow. They used it to spank us in a battle. We said, we'll have a little bit of that. We then took the longbow on board and used it very successfully in the wars against France, and hence it became the English longbow. But beyond that, there are so many myths about it. And one of the things that we know, we absolutely know for a fact, in the reenactment circles, and, and I think in the sort of the English longbow circles as well, is that a longbow arrow will shoot through a three inch oak door has happened at some siege or other. Does it? Stop. Okay, this is embarrassing. There's no other way of dealing with this. I've made a video and I think there's good footage in it and the content is good, but I don't like the way I've done it. I've done something that I don't usually do in films. I've been absolutely adamant about things. I've stated things like they're basically fact. I've gone on rants. That's not what I do. That's not what the lockdown longbow films, it's not what Todd's workshop is about. And Greg, who edited this film, has done a great job pulling it all together, but it's not the flavour of film that I wanted. So I am now going to pop up from time to time and just give a slightly more balanced, slightly less ranty explanation in certain places. And we'll try and pull it all back together to be a nice, coherent film about three myths to do with longbows. Thank you. Carry on. And I have a number of planks. This one here is half inch, 12 mil. We're gonna shoot them. Start at 12 mil, and then I go to 18, about 26, 27, so a bit over an inch, and then we can go from there. I have supposed that it is in fact the needle bodkin, type seven needle bodkin, which is the arrow that stands the most chance of going through that. So we're gonna try that. And the next test is one that I hear again and again. It's less perceived accepted wisdom, but I hear it a lot, is that arrows drill their way into a target. Sure, they're going forward, but they're also rotating because the fletchings make them do that. And they strike and they drive themselves in by that rotation, that drilling action. Do they drill their way in? Let's find out. And the last test we're gonna do is about the Mongols and silk shirts. Again, it is absolutely known wisdom that the Mongols wore silk shirts because when an arrow strikes on the shirt, it pushes in, the whole arrow in the shirt goes into the wound, all you need to do to remove the arrow is pull the silk shirt, out it pops, everybody's happy. So we have a leg of lamb here and two different kinds of silk. We have basically a shirt silk, a very fine one. I have an idea that modern processing actually weakens silk, so I don't know if this is true to form for what the Mongols would have had, but you know, we'll try that. The other one is the only natural silk that I could find and is a much coarser weave, but it is a natural silk. So we'll try both and we'll see what happens. Let's go shoot some stuff. Back down at the range with the lockdown longbow and some type 16 barbed arrowheads. Probably about as similar as ones that I figure you're gonna put against flesh or the Mongols would have put against flesh. This is nominally a 160 pound longbow. Uh, obviously the Mongols used well, bows up to that weight, I believe, but intrinsically they're faster bows, the Mongol ones. So a lighter bow weight is going to drive an arrow faster than an English longbow would. So, you know, it's all swings and roundabouts. We don't really know. I'm just giving you an approximation. Anyway, leg of lamb covered in the nice sort of dress silk, the shirt silk rather than the, the rough natural stuff. Let's shoot it, see what happens. And pause. The lockdown longbow is shooting English warbow style arrows. They're heavy and they're slow, and they're quite different to Mongol style arrows. Much lighter, much faster. But this is the bow that I'm trialing in these videos. However, it does give us an indication of what would be happening. But again, silk shirts and arrows is something that there is so much more work to be done on. But it's just interesting. Does it do what the myths say it does? Let's find out. Well, that was a strike onto our leg of lamb, which of course is going to be dinner. So I think it's going to be butterfly and barbecued. Oh, that's another one. That's still got the bone in it. I don't know if I'm striking the bone or not, but I guess we'll find out shortly. Oh, 
Rats, I snatched that one. Oh. Right, and then the fourth. <laughs> Convincingly in. Let's go see what we got. Well, the myth goes that all I need to do now to remove my arrows is to pull the silk. Let's find out. Well, the silk, uh, I think it's fair to say that shirt silk does not get dragged into the wound. Three bloody torn holes through the silk. On nice, modern, clean shirt silk, whether there's a difference between that and the stuff that the Mongols used, I don't know. Either way, it absolutely does not do what the myths say it does. Let's try it with the natural stuff, the coarser weave, see if that does anything. I'm back with the leg of lamb and a slightly coarser but natural, undyed, unbleached piece of silk. Let's find out what happens with our barbed arrows. Well, certainly in. Here we are, back with our leg of lamb. Two strikes, bottom one missed, but these two are convincingly on it. And let's pull the silk and the arrows out with it. Oh, look at that. Hmm. Messy. I'm back at the range now with some pieces of seasoned oak, different thicknesses, and some type seven needle bulkins. And I have some oak, handily marked in metric and imperial. 12 mil, half inch, 18 mil, three quarter inch, 26 mil, one inch. And if it gets through that, 45 mil, inch and three quarters. I can go thicker if it goes through that, but I'm suspecting it won't. Let's go shoot it. Well, that went through. <laughs> I don't think we need to do any more tests on that one. It sailed through the 12 mil or half inch. Let's see what it does to the 18 mil, three quarter inch. <laughs> well, it did for that one too. 26 mil or one inch. Oh, good. <laughs> I must say, I wasn't expecting that. My thinking on the last bit of shooting that I did was that the arrow came in and just split the plank apart. There was nothing holding the plank in from the side. So it's not like it was on the side of a wagon or a hoarding on a castle or indeed a door. So now I've just put it in a frame as if the planks next to it are holding it in and we're gonna shoot it again. This is another piece of 26 mil, one inch thick oak. And we're gonna see how this behaves. I think it'll probably behave very differently to the last piece of this thickness that we shot. Let's give it a go. Well, it split it, but it didn't go through, that's for sure. So we're gonna give it another one and just see if I can get it a little bit lower, a little bit right, and we'll see how that behaves. Again, stopped it. Let's go have a look and pause. Now the phrase shooting through a piece of wood means different things to different people. In my head, what I was thinking that meant was that the arrow would strike the wood and would pass on through as if it's a couple of sheets of cardboard being able to strike somebody down a metre away on the other side. For me, in my head, that's what shooting through a piece of wood is. Those arrowheads quite clearly penetrated the wood and poked out the back side of the wood. Trouble if you're leaning against it. If you're not leaning against the side of the wood, nothing at all. So my interpretation is that they didn't go through the piece of wood. And that's just the way I was thinking about it in my head. Probably didn't make it very clear in the film. But what is very interesting is where did this myth come from? Where did it originate from? Was it two drunk guys in a bar thinking that this could happen? Or was it a historical document? Please come back and let us know. I'd love to know the origins of it. The first thing to comment on is this. I kind of thought that that would happen. That's why I've been doing lots of non-hard tests with these arrows before we get into these ones, so we don't have to repair them too often. So that's the first one. Uh, yeah, and the second one as well, in fact. Now then, if we pull this off and we'll have a look what's going on on the back. Oh, goodness me. Right, well, oh, in fact, I've just lost it. So first of all, this needle book in here, in fact, the tip, it was just attached a little bit and it's now just broken off, in fact, it's fractured. Uh, this one's still intact, but you can see that they've come through 
But you know, they are going to turn around corners, they are going to get bent and deformed because this has got its own natural grain, it's going to follow that. Oak is hard, it is hard. So I think we can quite clearly see that they have stopped it. It has not gone all the way through when you contain them in a frame. The next test is really a very simple one. Does the arrow drill itself into the target? Well, no, it shoots into the target, doesn't it? Obviously. But there is a theory out there about how the arrow spins, because of course the arrow does spin as it goes through the air. And that is done by the fletchings on the end. There is a slight curvature to the fletchings. So any slight bending on the spine will help to get offset by the fletchings spinning the arrow and it will shoot straighter, just like a rifle, just like anything else that spins when, it, when it's thrown or shot. That's the theory. So the arrow does spin. That is a dead fact. How much does it spin? Because the theory is when it's, it's going, it's spinning and it strikes the target and it's still spinning and so it does that. Well, let's test it. So I've taken a Type 9 plate cutting short bodkin. I've put some orange and black tape on it to make it really clear in frame. And I filmed it at a thousand frames a second. Watch this, see what you make of it. What did I do there? Well, there is a rod set up one meter from the target, exactly one meter, and I shot just to one side of that rod. So all the distances are basically true, and that is at one meter. Now the arrow passes that, and we can then calculate if there was some rotation to be seen, we can calculate what the RPM is and get some sort of feel for does it drill into the target? Well, the arrow spins, we do know that, so it has some revolutions per minute. But as it passes that mark there, you can see that there is orange underneath, so we can see that there's orange there. You can't quite see what's on top because of the sun. It could be black, it could be orange. As it gets into shade, you can now see that it's orange. What that would mean is the arrow would be turning this way, if that were true. But this arrow with the fletchings spins in the other direction. So what that means is we know, because at the end frames there where it's clearly in shot, it is clearly orange, or almost all orange, as far as we can tell. So what it's not doing is spinning in that direction, not with any significance. It is spinning, yes, it's definitely spinning, but over that meter distance, what it's not doing is going round and round and round. It's not doing that. So I would say, from that test that we've done there, does the arrow drill into the target in the sense of does it hit and it's got so much inertia in its spin that it's still doing that and it bores its way into the target? No, it doesn't do that. Arrows do not drill into targets. And pause. A bit too adamant there, a bit too this is a fact. A fairly crude test, but I think it gives a good indication that they're not rattling around like a power drill. Let's carry on. Now clearly I wasn't there on the steppes of Mongolia in 1282 or whenever it was, but I took two kinds of silk and a Type 16, so a bladed arrowhead, and I shot the arrow against the silk, backed up by a leg of lamb. Straight through, absolutely convincingly straight through. So the whole concept for me of, can you just pull the silk shirt and the arrow pops out with it? Bunkum, absolute rubbish. Did it work? As myth says, no it didn't. And pause. Bit too adamant there. Now, it's a very singular test that I did. It is that heavy arrow against that piece of silk. But I think the point I'm making is that there was no hint of that working, not in that situation. And so there was nothing there that made me think that there could be some truth to the origins of the myth. I really jumped the gun there because actually, of course, battlefields are very varied places, different weight bows, different velocities of arrows, different distances, different silk shirts. So there is a lot more in this. Does it work? The tests I did, not remotely. Would it work under other circumstances? Quite possibly. But interestingly about silk, there is a lot more to talk about. Duelists, for instance, used to favour it over linen shirts because it's less likely to get pulled into the bullet wound and less likely to break pieces off and, and go in. So that's obviously an advantage. Even into modern times, um, bulletproof armour could be made of multiple layers of silk because it was available there and did the job. So there is a lot more to silk than meets the eye. But these tests, they showed me no hint of what the myths say. And the next one up is do arrows shoot through a three inch oak door? Another, certainly in the UK, myth about longbows. Now an oak door, you have to assume that the oak in that is seasoned. 
so I use seasoned oak. Now, if it was the hoarding of a castle wall, it might well be green, you know, they may have knocked it up in a hurry. Uh, a cart is more likely to be seasoned. So whatever it may have been, whether it's seasoned or whether it's green, green oak, of course, is less resistant. I chose the hardest version of it. I shot some thinner planks, and then actually during the course of the filming, it occurred to me, of course, that when it's part of a structure and the board is not being split apart and shoved sideways, it might be more resistant. So I did it eventually with a, a one inch, a 26 mil board, and the arrows went clean through. We tried it again by framing it like this, and that is what we end up with, with the arrows. So they don't go clean through. Now you're clearly not gonna to want to be laying your torso against that or your knee against it if you're leaning out over the hoarding, but the arrows do not go through that. So do they go through a three inch oak door? Absolutely they will not. And pause. Oh, I'm sorry, I've done it again. Been too adamant. It's the danger of blanket statements. As I said earlier, in my head, I was thinking that the arrow would go passing through the wood. That's what I meant by, does an arrow go through the wood? Well, my 26 mil, my one inch plank. I say the arrow hasn't passed through. The guy leaning across it with his chest on it might go, well, it kind of feels like it went through to me. So it depends on your interpretation. Would that needle bulkin go through three inches of oak? Well, it might just hint about poking out the other side. I don't actually know the answer to that because I now haven't tested that. I don't think it would actually. I really genuinely don't think it would. But where are the origins of that? That I'd really like to know. Now, what it would say to me is that perhaps if you want a hoarding effective against longbow arrows, you'd probably want to go to about an inch and a half. Now that brings us to a modern myth again, a pop culture myth. You know, when the cops and the baddies have a shootout, somebody jumps behind the car door, two layers of 0.9, 1.1 millimeter steel, and wham, bam, it stops all bullets dead. Well, it's, of course, it's rubbish. So the medieval version of that, and we had John Carter in a previous film, not that John Carter. He jumped into his cart, he sheltered from the ambush arrows. Would his cart siding have saved him? Well, I would say that a cart siding is probably gonna be 12 mil, 15 mil, maybe 18 mil thick. It's not gonna be the one inch, the 25 mil, 26 mil that this was. So in that case, I think a cart probably would not have saved the guy. And you would, if you're a military, you're going to know what thickness you want for your hoardings, which I'm guessing is going to be about 35 mil, inch and a half, something like that. Three inch oak door, no way on the planet. Now, of course, what was very clear about my arrows when I struck the oak board was that the two I shot both broke. Now, there's some of you out there are going to be going, oh, you've got to go back to the manufacturer, Will Sherman, excellent man. You've got to go back to him and you've got to complain. You know, arrows are rubbish, they broke. Well, you know what? They're not meant to do this. Arrows are against flesh. They're against things that give. They're not against oak doors. You know, you buy a car, you wrap it around a tree, you don't complain to the manufacturer that the car's broken. Of course it's broken. You've just wrapped it around a tree. I've just shot it at a basically a movable object. Arrows broke. That's what happens, all right? Will Sherman's arrows, medieval arrows, fantastic. And the last of our myths that we looked at was do arrows drill their way into the target? So I got this arrow here with the black and the orange tape. We shot it. We saw that quite clearly it wasn't spinning massively. It spins, we know they spin. That's what they're meant to do. That's what the fletchings do. But it's not spinning round like a hammer drill is spinning round. Does that allow it to spin its way into the target and drill in? I didn't see that on the film, but here's the thing. Even without seeing it, just as a little thought experiment, if you know anything about arrows, you'll know this to be true. If you think of a leaf-shaped arrowhead or a type 16, a bladed one, or even the really big swallowtails, of course they cannot spin as they go into the target. They're not gonna do it. And so as they strike, the arrowhead is gonna to want to stop immediately and just carry on going forward. It's not gonna rotate. And the glue here within the arrowhead and the shaft, which is not remotely as good in medieval times as the epoxy we use now, that's just gonna give up. And the shaft, if that's what it was doing, is just gonna spin and fall out and they don't just spin and fall out. That's not what they do. So quite clearly, from the video evidence I showed you, from the little thought experiment I've just given you there, the arrows spin, of course they spin, but they're not spinning like a drill. Back for my last intervention. The video has been about three myths to do with the longbow, but actually it's been about more than that because I've been caught up in something that I try really hard not to do. And that is what these little interventions are for. 
the way we all learn is by basing a truth on a truth on a truth. And if you come in and you add things in there which are incorrect, it diverts people's energies, it misleads them, it stops them truly understanding the subject matter. And I am really careful to try and filter out the junk that is in my head and to just deal with stuff that I know to be true. And that's why my videos are often very observational, because if I see it there, I can now know the truth of it. And I didn't interpret this film like that, and that's why it went a little bit off the rails. But that is interesting in the sense that what I'm not trying to do is denigrate anybody for believing these myths, because I am absolutely guilty of things like that as well. You know, I was talking about Teflon-coated bullets in another video I did a while back. I've stirred my memory about where I knew that from. And actually, for any of you who remember it, it was a sci-fi show called V in the late 80s. And that's where I first learned about them. And I think that that's where it all lodged in my head. So I too can do these things. You know, there's no shame in it. It's just trying to filter out the junk. Well, this has certainly been a slightly odd film for me, um, but I hope it's worked for you in the end. Thank you very much. Yeah.